You may be seated. I think of Dr. Scheel, and I often think that he's like Jesus in my life. I heard about him a long time before I finally saw him. Praise the Lord. And he's also like Jesus in that all those good things I heard about him are true. Praise the Lord. It's an honor to be here tonight with uh, Dr. Scheel and all of you good folks. And I always am in a hurry when I get to the pulpit, and I am right now. And uh, But I, I want to take a few moments and say how much I love the Shield family. Dr. Shield has become such a personal friend, somewhat of an elder and advisor in my life. And I appreciate Sister Shield so much. She's a Christian lady. I enjoy being in their home. I like to be around them together. I'm kind of a quiet person by nature, and I like to just watch him, enjoy just watching him. She's got his number, folks. Let me just tell you that right now. She is such a godly woman and an example to anybody that wants to know what a Christian woman's all about. You can look to her for an example. Amen. And I want to say how much I appreciate also his family, Brother Jason Shield and Sister Violet. I say this without hesitation tonight. Brother Jason and Sister Violet, I admire you and respect you as much as anybody I know in America. Their life and their testimony has just been exemplary. And what a wise step it is to make this uh, step in your church that this is now Bishop Shield and this is now Pastor Shield. What a wonderful, wonderful moment. Both of them will tell you, don't let that little title bishop make you think he's washed up. The only thing that's changed really is the titles, praise the Lord. That's so good to be with them. And I was thinking about his family. What a blessing they are, not just to this local church, but to all of America. I got to thinking about Sister Valen and Sister Vonda uh, when I first met them. Sister uh, Vonda was a young uh, girl, not yet married. And I felt about her like I did Brother Strevel's daughters and my own daughter. Uh, She is such a fine young lady, exemplary, beautiful, and classy dresser. I just honestly, I thought there's just nobody good enough for Von DeShield. And I feel sorry because all those boys out there uh, wish they could marry her, but they're not good enough. Praise the Lord. But amazingly, she found a young man that is such a wonderful young man. And she was just as classy in her selection of a husband as she was in her clothes and the other issues of her life. And I love Brother George. He's kind of a, this may sound corny to you, but I'm preaching. And when you preach, sometimes you think, I think things you do are corny, so it's all right. But uh, I'll tell you about Brother George. He's just got a quiet, godly nature about him. And and, uh, this is the part that's corny. I just like to stand by him sometimes. He probably hadn't even noticed that. But every time I come here, we go to the altar. I just go stand by George. Hallelujah. I just like it. He just, it's just, I pray by him. Today I come in and sit by him. And I don't have no reason other than I just like him. Praise the Lord. Don't mean I don't like you. I just can't sit by all of you, all right? Amen. And then Dustin and Valen and their two boys. Dustin's just fun to hang out with. He picks me up at the airport. He gives me the lowdown on everybody in the whole family. Praise the Lord. So I well connected, praise the Lord. And Sister Valen, I love her so much. I remember when I first saw her, I was at a meeting in Louisiana, and I was already aware of who Sister Vonda was. Uh, every young man in America was looking her way that was single, seemed like. So I was at a meeting down in Louisiana, and they had her sing. And I was anticipating it. She's a wonderful, wonderful singer, anointed. And she got up to sing, and I was standing by Tim Copeland. And uh, uh, when Sister Valen went to that organ and started playing that organ, I confess it was the first time I had been distracted while listening to Sister Vonda sing. I heard that organ, and I'm telling you, I was like a schizophrenic. I couldn't decide who to listen to. I wanted to to hear the song and the organ and all those licks and tricks that she was doing on that organ. And I leaned over to Brother Copeland, who himself is quite a, a pianist. He won't tell you that. He's very modest. Yeah, I don't know if you know this or not, Tim Copeland in his high school senior year won the 
won the competition to play for the Houston Philharmonic Orchestra. He memorized a 42-page Mozart concerto in D-flat minor and played it flawless. And so he, he's, he knows a little bit about keyboards. And I said, Brother Copeland, who is playing that organ? He said, that's Sister Vonda's sister, Sister Valenz. That was the first time I ever laid eyes on her. She's a wonderful organist. This family is just an exemplary family. And uh, that is also reflected in this church. I want to compliment this church. You are one of the friendliest, kindest, servant-minded churches I have ever found anywhere. It's constantly, can I do anything to help you? Is there anything I can get you? Can I make your stay more comfortable? And uh, I appreciate it all. Uh, I needed to sacrifice a little bit. And so this year, uh, by the help of the Lord, I'm doing that. I'm staying in accommodations that are, are make, make me sacrifice a little bit. But... Praise the Lord. It's, it's worth it to preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see all the preachers that are here tonight. I love them. They're my friends, but they sure make me nervous. Praise the Lord. Appreciate the good word of the Lord that's gone forth. Would you stand with me? Appreciate Sister Holland's message. Not only her message, but her life behind her message. Appreciate Brother Tim Bourne last night. Uh, if you are not here for either of those, I highly recommend you get the CDs. Tim Bourne is just an incredible young man, doing a wonderful job. Preached outstanding last night. And Sister Martin, are you in here, Sister Martin? There's only one of you, and it's so good to hear you again. I'm going to tell all of them what I told you. I, tell her that the, I told her, I said, one of the highest forms of flattery is emulation. And I said, every time she speaks, I take so many notes, and then I go home and preach it, and I look so good to my people. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that good word today. These shoes are made for walking. And you can tell the elder is just not a worldly guy because he got up here and talked about that worldly song, these shoes are, well, elder, it's these boots are made for walking. Just, so I am more worldly and carnal than he is. If you press me, I might even be remain, able to remember who sang it, praise the Lord. <laughs> but it slippeth thy servant at the moment, yes. <laughs> and uh, Brother Don Johnson appreciated his words so very much. Amen. Amen. And I want to say congratulations to my newest sister in the Lord. What a... We've been praying for a long time for you to get the Holy Ghost. Ain't no telling what the Lord's going to do through her and this community. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's just uh, say to the Lord that we want his will to be done in this service tonight. Would you just lift your hands and ask the Lord to help us? In the name of Jesus, right now we pray your blessing, your anointing, and your Holy Ghost on this service tonight. I pray, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus name Amen You may be seated musicians You can go down Thank you so much Good to see all of you men My friends Brother Sorrells Long time friend Good to see him tonight Brother Parker A man that I admire greatly And the work he's doing These men from Winsong You have no idea How much we admire And respect What's going on In your lives too but We want to say Thank you for being here Brother Jones and his family, Brother Thrasher, Brother Robinson, good to see him. My friend, Brother Hancock, God bless him. Brother Massey, long-time friend, God bless him. And these men that I didn't know, but today, I, I just wanted to say this. Today, I felt such an anointing on some of these men. I was sitting over there, and this brother right here, I, I, Brother Gregory, do I have him? He came up today, and I, I felt the Holy Ghost. And I, I, I thought, Lord, it's so good to just feel that a man has an anointing on his life and brother uh, Joe Smith Street whoever he is I'm, I'm going to have to work on that one hallelujah but uh, while he was introducing brother Johnson such a such a just a touch of God on his life and uh, I appreciate that so much um, I'm going to preach to you tonight if the Lord will help me and I know the hour is late but I'll I'll hurry to the best of my ability I am I'm very stirred in my spirit uh, I'm 54 years old and don't know how many more years I've got to preach. 
to do the work of the Lord. Don't know how long the Lord is going to delay His coming. But there is a genuine hunger in my heart to truly have uh, a move of God, a sovereign move of God. And I have been wrestling in myself, and this is just a passing statement, not, certainly not my subject matter tonight. I have been wrestling in myself that very possibly in my life, the real battle of the flesh and spirit is not the flesh that would lust or desire cigarettes or alcohol or movies or the elementary things that we laid aside many, many years ago. The real battle of the flesh that I'm finding in the New Testament as I go through it is flesh seems to always want to take control even in spiritual matters. And I worry that it's so easy to lean on the flesh even in the areas of attempting to serve God. Learning it and doing it for so long that I lose the keen edge of seeking after God's perfect will and and how He wants it done. So I promise you tonight that I have given great effort to this service and want to be a blessing. Let me take a moment here and just lean on my friends for a moment. Uh, Brother Sorrows, let me use you. Brother Sorrows, just give me the name of a great person out of the Bible. Anybody. First one that comes to your mind. Timothy. Timothy. Thank you. Brother Parker, give me the name of a great person. Paul. Dr. Shield, give me the name of a great person in the Bible. Anybody. That's good. John, good name. Brother Thrasher, give me the name of a great person in the Bible. David. Brother Robinson, where are you? Right there. Give me the name of a great person in the Bible. Moses, absolutely. Brother Hancock, give me the name of a great man in the Bible. Joseph. Brother Massey, where are you? Give me the name of a great person in the Bible. Abraham. These are all great Names. Several times in my life I have done what I just did. And I'm going to tell you the results of that little informal survey. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 35, I'll read my text scripture tonight. Second Chronicles 35 and verse 25. If you have it, say amen. amen. Better wait a moment then. Amen. If you have it, lift your eyes. Praise the Lord. It's right in front of you. Amen. If you have it, say amen. amen. All right. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah. In their lamentations to this day. And made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the lamentations. Because they are written in the lamentations. Why don't we read what Jeremiah penned concerning Josiah? If you will turn to the book of Lamentations. Chapter number four and verse number 20. When Jeremiah was lamenting for Josiah, these were the words that he spoke. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord was taken in their pits of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. By the help of the Lord tonight, I'm going to preach you a biographical message. There are all kinds, exegetical, subject matter, doctrinal. But tonight, I'm going to preach to you simply on the subject of Josiah. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. One of the reasons that I asked my brethren to name a great person in the Bible 
on a couple of occasions I have done this. It's always been surprising to me in my own life as well. I'm in the same category as them. If you caught me in a moment that I was unprepared and just said to me, speak, say, give me the names of some great people in the Bible, I would have cataloged pretty much the same as they did tonight. Abraham, Moses, Joshua might have thought along the lines of David, maybe some of the greater prophets, New Testament era, of course, the disciples, the apostles, the apostle Paul, etc. Very seldom would my mind have ever drifted to this man by the name of Josiah. In fact, never have I asked anyone to give me the name of a great person in the Bible that anyone ever submitted for a candidacy the name Josiah. And yet I want to tell you tonight, before I even start talking about him, I want to tell you that in the annals of your Bible, from the beginning of Genesis to the ending of Revelation, never in the history of the Bible did anybody ever have as great a revival as Josiah had in his lifetime. Secondly, no one ever had a revival that reached further, did more, and impacted more people than Josiah did. If you're not interested in revival, and I appreciate the comments by others tonight, Brother Thrasher touched on this. If you're not interested in revival, this will probably be the longest, boringest message you've ever heard. But if there's one little ounce in your heart that says, I like to be a part of revival, whether you pastor a church, whether you play an instrument, whether you sing in the choir, or whether you're just a church goer, or you're a visitor. If there's something inside of you that says, I'm hungry for revival, I came to preach to you tonight. I want revival in my personal life. I want revival in my personal church. I want revival in the churches of my friends and my workers around me. I want to see a Holy Ghost revival that we have never seen before before and if you're one of the disdainers and you're one of the speculators and you think that revival is over I refuse to believe in a God that has already done his greatest work I refuse to believe that God is all of a sudden on the decline I have to believe that God still has plans to give the greatest revival that he's ever given to the world I want it in my life it's impossible to talk about Josiah without including Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the most interesting characters in your Bible. He lived a very, very dramatic life. And believe me, when you say that about somebody in the Bible, you're up against stiff competition. Jeremiah never really liked his role. Through all the excitement, if you study his life, he remained reluctant insecure, and often unhappy. God chose him to be over the nations and the kingdoms, to root out and pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. To accomplish that task, God gave him only one resource. And that was his mouth. How did he respond to this challenge when confronted by God? He said, oh, Lord God, I, I cannot speak. I am but a child. He didn't stride forward and arrogantly push himself forward. Most of the time of his life, he barely hung on and let everybody know that he wasn't encouraged about his job. His only encouragement was the promise that God gave him when he said, I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land. I want you to know tonight that for 40 long years, Jeremiah preached a message and gave warnings to people who did not want to hear it. They so disliked his message that several times they arrested him and placed him in the prison and at one point almost killed him. You know what his message was? He said, I want you to know that the Babylonians are coming. I want you to know that you're not going to escape the judgment of God. I want you to know 
that you cannot live the way you're living and not invoke God's displeasure nor his judgment. I want you to know that you cannot align yourself with the nations around you and fail to trust in God and not pay a price somewhere. The power of his book doesn't come from its negativity, but it's the man himself, the composite total of all the things that he is. For he is like a man demented in his mind, and he is preaching like a man who has awakened from a terrible, horrible nightmare. And all he wants to do is tell everybody what's going on. And he weeps and he cries and he begs and he pleads for 40 long years. And nobody seems to listen. No prophet in the Bible, cover to cover, exposes his feelings more than Jeremiah. You can read in the Bible how that he told God, I don't like this and I don't like that. He argued with God. He quarreled with God. He told God he thought he wasn't fair with him. And God did what he does to most of us. Basically, he said, suck it up. It's going to get worse. God said to Jeremiah, you cannot get married. You cannot have a wife. You can never go to a birthday party. You can never go to a funeral. You can never go to a social activity. That's not on your agenda. You are my servant and you are to do exactly what I tell you to do. Jeremiah didn't like it. He argued with God and God said, too bad, just do what I tell you. He's a wonderful example of what it's like to live for God. Everything you do in serving the Lord is not going to suit your fancy. Your job is not to like it all the time. Your job is to obey and submit to the will of God. And so when he was finished with his ministry after five kings and 40 years, he wrote a book called the book of lamentations that I read a segment from tonight. The book of lamentations in itself is an incredible insight into this mind of the man, Jeremiah. Jeremiah loved Jerusalem and the work of God possibly like no other man before or since. He was consumed with it. He was eaten up with it. He saw the decline that had happened to the nation of Israel. He looked back down its littered history and realized that this nation should be glorious. This nation should be powerful this nation should be in the limelight of the world and this nation is cowering and trembling before foreign kings like a people that are impoverished and don't have anything to lean on and it bothered jeremiah and he loved jerusalem and he wanted jerusalem to be strong and vibrant and brilliant and successful and when the hammer of justice finally fell jeremiah was so destroyed he was so distraught. He wept so heavily. He picked up his pen and quill and wrote the book that we call Lamentations. If you read it, it's like a man that's dazed with grief over something that he lost that he loved so dearly. He weeps and he prays when he sees the desolation of the children. He looks at Jerusalem when it is barricaded and surrounded by the Babylonians for 18 long months. And he weeps when he sees women take their own children and put them into a boiling cauldron and feed the rest of their family with the flesh of their own child and it rips his heart out and he weeps before God at the terrible judgment that has come on the children of God but at the end of his book he includes a little segment concerning this man Josiah and he says concerning Josiah I read it to you tonight. He said, of whom we said, under his shadow, we will live among the heathen. You and I both know that they went into captivity. You and I are aware of the fact that the northern kingdom had already been gone for over a hundred years. The history of Israel is such a pockmarked history. 120 years under Saul, David, and Solomon each of the first three kings ruled for 40 years over a united kingdom. For the next 200 years, there was a divided kingdom. There was a civil war ripped asunder because of the indulgences of Solomon. Solomon built the temple, and Solomon did a whole lot of nice things. But when he couldn't pay his bills, he traded off northern cities to the, to the kings that he had borrowed and bought from. And it generated a hate. And a, and a dislike in the northern tribes. And when his son, Rehoboam, came... I'm sorry if you don't like Bible preaching, and I'm not telling fancy stories, but I'm going to preach to you the Bible tonight. 
That's what we used to do more than we do now. We have now learned the art of entertainment and preaching, where preaching becomes nothing more to make you feel good or nothing more to make you feel like you've been to some presentation. But I'm telling you, I came tonight to preach the Bible. The Bible. Rehoboam said, no, we will not do what the elders suggest. And you know the story. Ten tribes resisted, revolted, and went north. Jeroboam was anointed as the first king. And for the next 200 plus years, there were two nations side by side. When you read your Bible, if you're not aware of that single fact, you'll get confused in the book of Kings and Chronicles. Both the book of Kings and Chronicles were originally one book. But they took those books, and when they added the English vowels to the Hebrew simple system of only consonants, the books were too large. And so they broke them into First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles so the books would not be so lengthy. First Kings basically devised after the reign of Solomon. And then in Chronicles, it's a completely different approach. It has been criticized by people that don't know the Bible or love the Bible as some kind of whitewashed uh, uh, view of their history. But but Kings was written before they went into captivity and Chronicles was written after they came back from captivity because when they came back they were a beaten down people only 42,000 people out of the entire nation decided to come home when Cyrus signed the decree of all the people that went down into Babylon of all the hundreds of thousands that were carried away only 42,000 were willing to brave the wilderness and the existing uh, situation in Jerusalem no temple no wall nothing to protect them and so the writers of the Chronicles were finding every little thing they could to encourage the people and when you read it yes it doesn't talk about the bad it does not even mention David and Bathsheba it does not mention the failures they had already been recorded but it reached back and said wait just a moment I'm going to do CPR on this nation and pump blood back into that body and let them know that this nation can live again and the promise of God can and will be fulfilled Fulfilled. So when you read Chronicles, you don't get some of the terrible situations that you read in Kings. You have to compare the books to get them both. Chronicles basically dismisses the northern tribes because for 200 years they had 19 kings, Brother Jason. And this is hard to believe that 19 times in a row a man stepped to the throne. 19 times in a row, less than 50 miles away, there were men having great revival and building great things for God. And not one of them turned their heart to the Lord. For 200 years, 19 kings in a row in the northern kingdom of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. They started by following Jeroboam, setting up the golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel. And they did it to compete with the temple that Solomon had built. And Jeroboam reestablished the old religion that they attempted to follow when they came out of Egypt by setting up the golden calves. Interestingly, I think I've told you this before, archaeologically when they found those calves, we think of them as some big monument that people bowed down to. They found them in an archaeological excavation and they were literally four inches tall that's how big the golden calves were that Jeroboam set up on the edges of his country and that's the smallness of the God that they served for 200 years I'm here to tell you whose God can even begin to compare with the God that we serve your God of cocaine your God of sex your God of immorality is such a cheap little God compared to the real God that brings salvation so the nation was united for 120 years it split into two nations for approximately 200 years after that the Assyrian nation marched in Rabshika gathered the armies of Sennacherib walked through the northern regions of Samaria and took 46 walled cities knocked them down and conquered them totally and led two hundred thousand people away in chains in the year 721 BC and for the next hundred and thirty years the southern nation 
existed alone without the companionship of the northern nation. The southern nation that existed for approximately 335 years had 19 kings and one queen. Of those kings, there were approximately eight of them that were good kings. Even though they weren't numerically in the majority, the number of years that they served and sat on the throne far exceeded the number of years of the people who did not serve the Lord. Initially, there was Rehoboam and Abijam. They served a combined 20 years. When they left the throne, a young man by the name of Asa sat on the throne for the next 41 years. And Israel had the great enjoyment of two kings back to back that did good, followed by Jehoshaphat for 25 years. And for 66 good years, they had men that sat on the throne that wanted to follow the ways of the Lord and institute revival in their land. They were followed by three kings of short duration, Jehoram of eight years, Ahaziah one year, Athaliah the wicked queen for seven years and so for 16 years there was a backward swing of the pendulum and it didn't go well but there followed during that a period of four consecutive kings over a total of 137 years that followed after God there was Joash for 40 years Amaziah for 29 years Azariah better known as Uzziah for 52 years and finally Jotham for 16 years and the nation seemed to be on the ropes of recovery it looked like things were going to go good for a while because for 137 years as long as anybody could remember they were following after God they were trying to do the right things for 137 years and then tragedy struck in the form that once again there was a regression after 137 years of pleasing God Ahaz comes to the throne and for 16 years they revert on the backward pendulum swing He's followed by a man that caught his balance, and his name is a household name in Pentecostal circles. He's followed by a man by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a brilliant leader. He is a great king. He has some of the greatest moments in Israel's history. He is privileged to have in his court advice a man by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah reaches his pinnacle of his ministry during the reign of Hezekiah. The ultimate moment is when Sennacherib knocks on his door and threatens to take Jerusalem like he took all those other 46 walled cities. And he sends Rabshika to utter his threats and to mock them and make fun of them and calls Hezekiah. You hear me now. You listen to that. He called Hezekiah a caged bird because he was locked inside the city of Jerusalem. And he just basically he said you think you're going to get out of this mess what about all those other 46 cities I conquered every one of them you sir are history and they said wait 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 don't talk to us in Hebrew would you speak to us in the Assyrian tongue they said oh no we're going to talk to you because we want everybody to feel the dagger of threat right in the middle of their heart and in the peak of it all, Reb Shika rises to eloquence. And this is the famous passage that some of you remember. He screams at them in their Hebrew language. In fact, I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can find riders to put on them. He taunts them. He challenges them. He mocks them. They don't know what to do. But Hezekiah did the smartest thing in the world. He said, you know what I need you boys to do? When they came to him, they had ripped their clothes. They had a sackcloth and ashes. They said, Hezekiah, we don't know what to do. It looks bad. He said, I'm going to tell you what you do. Go find Isaiah and bring him to me. And let me tell you, one of the lessons of your life needs to be that in your darkest hour, when you are hedged in, hemmed in, and have no way out, the one person you need to get a hold of is the man of God. You don't need the advice of somebody else. You need the man of God. You need the Isaiah in in your life. Oh yeah. Hezekiah said, Isaiah, what do I do? Look at them. They're out there. <laughs> Isaiah calmly said, let me tell you what the Lord's like. He's like a song in the night. Don't worry about it. He said, oh, they're going to die by the sword. I don't have time to preach the whole Bible tonight. Just trust me, it's in there. I'll show it to you after church. You don't believe me. He said, they're going to die by the sword, but none of your soldiers will lift a hand. Oh, they will perish, but you don't have to do anything. 
And I really do wish I had time to preach this little story because it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I like to talk about how the sentries began to peek over the wall the next morning. And the whole Assyrian army wasn't wiggling. No campfires burning. No fires being built. And finally, after the sun came up an hour or two, somebody said, well, somebody go check. Not me. Not, 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 nobody wanted to go check because they, they thought it was a trap. But finally, one brave soul makes his way out, tiptoes out there. They're all watching from the wall. And he goes up to the first Assyrian and he looks at him and he can't believe his eyes. They're dead. And he kicks the sandal of one of them. And he reaches back over his shoulder and says, they're dead. And somebody says, is it a trap? No, they're dead. Because the angel of the Lord had walked through the camp of the Assyrians that night at 185,000 Assyrians lay dead on the ground. I do things at home that I won't do at a meeting. I got up the other night. And, well, I don't have time really, but I got up the other night and I said, have you guys been following the news today? I said, you hear about that American division got surrounded by those Iraqi soldiers? They're like, no. I said, they didn't have any ammunition. And there was about 185,000 Iraqi soldiers. And I said, there was a chaplain in there. And that chaplain just told them, just pray, the Lord will kill all these Iraqis. All my people were looking at me like, no, no. I was telling it like it was so true. <laughs> I, 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 I hate to tell you how vulnerable they were. God bless their heart. They just believed me. And I finally told them, look, I'm just paraphrasing the way it happened. Because it's one thing for you to smile indulgently and sit on your nice little padded pew on the padded bench and look at the Bible and say, wow, that's a good story. But if it happened in today's newspaper, everybody would be testifying about how that American battalion was saved by the miraculous hand of God and a hundred and... That was Hezekiah's day. Instituted the Passover. The Syrian armies rolled back. They go like dogs with their tails tucked between their legs and go home. You would have thought that would have put the fear of God in any... Hezekiah got sick Isaiah came to him and said you're going to die he lay on his sick bed turned his face to the wall and pleaded with God for mercy and what did the Lord do for him the Lord said I will give you 15 years to your life his son followed him on the throne his son was 12 years old when he became king. His son, therefore, was born during the 15-year extension of the mercy of God to his father's life. You owe your life, Manasseh, to the fact that your father served God. And Manasseh became king. And for 57 years, he and his son, Manasseh for 55 years, and Ammon, his son, for two years, became the worst period in the history of the people of God recorded in your Bible. Manasseh is so wicked. He is so vile. How can a man... Born under those circumstances. How could a man born under the 15 year grace period of his father's extended life at the mercy of God come to the throne and not have heard the story about the charging Assyrian army? How can he have not sat on the knee of somebody and heard about the miraculous work of God? And yet in this young man's heart, from the very beginning, there was nothing but evil. And the Bible says that he was the worst king ever sat on the throne. The Bible says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathens. The Bible says that he went to the places where his father Hezekiah had torn down the altars of Baal and he rebuilt the altars of Baal. The Bible says that he worshipped all 
the host of heaven and he served them. Then he went right into the church house right into the temple. And the Bible says that he built altars to those false gods right in the house of God. And then he went out to the outer court and he built altars and monuments to all the host of heaven. He looked around and said, well, the heathen sacrifice their sons, so I will. And he went down to a place called Topheth. And he took his own children, the sons of his own body, and marched them through the fire and offered them to false gods. The Bible says that he observed times and he used enchantments. The Bible says that he worked with familiar spirits and wizards. He did much wickedness and he provoked God to anger more than any man had ever provoked God to anger before. In fact, God got so angry. This is what the Lord said to the prophets. You go and tell Manasseh that because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations and he hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him and hath made Judah to sin with his idols. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth it both his ears shall tingle and I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plum to the house of Ahab and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish wiping it and turning it upside down God was saying I am finished I'm through 19 kings in the north all bad look at what we have here look at this man and what he's done to the example of his father. Look at what his father has given to us as a nation. And look what he has done for 52 years. Taking him down the bank. And standing on the sidelines watching all of this. Was a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah watched. While Manasseh stooped so low. Because Isaiah offended him. Are you listening? Isaiah is the one that prophesied to his father. Isaiah is the one that said God will give you 15 more years. If it wasn't for Isaiah, Manasseh would have never been born. Jeremiah watched while Manasseh took Isaiah and placed him between two wooden planks and gave the command for them to saw the prophet Isaiah in half and watched as this demented ungodly man took the nation to a terrible place. In fact, the Bible says of Manasseh, says this of no other man in the Bible, he seduced them to do evil more than any king in their history. He died and his son followed him for seven more years. And so here's the nation tottering on the edge of captivity. And all of a sudden, a little boy, eight years old, becomes king. And you wonder why when we think of the Bible greats, that Josiah doesn't leap off the page and immediately stare at us and say, wait a minute, when you talk about great things, why don't you talk about me as well? For this young man became king when he was eight. And he only reigned for 31 years. But the revival that he had was a revival, first of all, in a land that God was sick and tired of. It was a revival in the land that nobody thought it could happen. But he made up his mind. We are going to have a move of God. And God's going to come back and visit his people. (laughs) Jeremiah saw what went on and Jeremiah encouraged him no doubt was his teacher Josiah was only 8 years old when he was 16 is anybody in here 16 years old if there's anybody 16 would you just stand for a moment anybody 16 years old there's one anybody else anybody anybody 16 I'm not going to do nothing I just want want them to look at what 16 year olds look like 
There they are. 60, 60. All right. He was that old right there. See those? That's how old he was. When he said, hmm, thank you, you may be seated. When he said, hmm, we're going to have a little revival around here. And for the next eight years, he started cleaning house. All around Jerusalem, every time he found a place where there had been a false temple built, you know what the Bible says he did? He, he didn't just tear it down and burn it. He would get on it with his own feet and stamp it to powder. He wanted everybody to know what he thought of every place Baal was worshipped and every false altar. And, and, and he didn't have a daddy to teach him. And he didn't have a grandpa to teach him. All he had was his heart. And his heart said, I'm tender before God. And I want to have a revival. And I don't want this nation to go down in defeat. And so every time he found one, he would burn it. And then he would get on it and he would stomp it with his feet. Just give me a few more moments and I'll quit. Let me talk to you about Josiah. First of all, he said, all right, we're going to destroy all the vessels of Baal. Bring me every pot, every implement of religious worship that has ever been used for Baal, and bring it to me. And they brought it, piled it up, and he destroyed it. And I love this part about him. You want to know how to have revival? I get so sick and tired of this little concept that we need to ease up to have revival. Now there's this big controversy. Maybe if we advertise on television that we'll have revival, we can get to the high rises. Or No, let me tell you how to revival. Every revival in this book, people fell more in love with God. They got more holiness than the generation before them. Every single one. I'm not saying this for any other reason of public consumption other than to underscore my point. I've read that Bible cover to cover for over 20 times and I cannot find a single place anybody ever had a move of God by getting easier. I never found anybody have revival by lightening up. Every single time it was back to the altar, take this off, give that up. So Josiah, he, he found all the vessels of Baal and he destroyed them. And you know what he did? He said, I don't even want the ashes left in my country. Get them out of here. Made him take them across the border up to Jeroboam's part. <laughs> That's right. He said, take them across the border and dump them. He wouldn't even let the ashes of the destroyed vessels stay in his country. Then the Bible says he took all the priests of Baal. By this time they're like, oh. He took all the priests of Baal and he killed them. He didn't put them on his platform. He didn't call them brother. He didn't say they have a different set of convictions. <laughs> he killed them. The Bible says he went and found every single grove. And when he found it, he stomped it to powder. I'm telling you, Josiah could have used Winsong. He could have put these guys to good use. He could have said, boys, we found another grove. We're going to have a stomping party today. All you wind song guys come here for just a moment. Get, get, get right here just a moment. And that, that, there, there's a grove we found right there, boys. And we got to stomp it to powder. So all you boys stomp a little bit here. Let's get. Stomp it, boys. That used to be Bale's ground, but now it's God's ground. Stomp it out. Get it out. Move it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then they'd find another one. They'd go stomp on that in a while. They stamped out every single place Baal's name had ever been mentioned. You ready for the next thing he did? You ready? You sure? This is America. Got to be politically correct. Can't say nothing about certain groups. The Bible says... He went and found the houses of the Sodomites. I'm really going to do bad here. Elder, correct me if I get too far out, all right? They knocked on the door and said, are you queer? Yeah, tear his house down. Are you a homosexual? Yeah, tear his house down. You're walking down the block and there's houses tore down. What happened here? Y'all have a tornado? Uh-uh. Josiah's tearing down all the houses of the homosexuals that want to act like they're the people of God. I 
I'm trying to hurry. God bless you. Sit down. Then he looked around. And he said, you know what? There's a place that's been making me nervous. He said, what's that, Josiah? Now, he's only 26 years old at this point. He's not this aged, wise man, but he's 26 years old. He said, there's a place out here that I don't like. It's a place called Topheth. And for a long time, it's been the central place where they offer their children to false gods. He said, I want to destroy it. And boy, here they come. Here come the stampers. Here come the stompers. Here come the destroyers. Crowbars and sledgehammers and the implements of destruction. And they tore into Topheth because he felt like it's time to build something that lasts. He looked back over the previous reigns of the kings and said, we're up and down, up and down. Yes, we do. No, we don't. It's time to build something that will last through anything. It's time to get our kids to the place that they can live for God no matter what hell throws at them no matter and they did I'll get to that in my closing remarks but they did the young people that came out of Josiah's revival did things that no one has ever done since so he tore down Topheth he decided it was time to stop losing our kids. Then he looked around. He said, them horses and them chariots there that are dedicated to the sun, kill them, burn them, tear them up. Wow, Josiah, them was perfectly good chariots. We could put them on eBay and make something out of them. He said, tear them up. He didn't say, send Egypt a little memo that we're going to have a used chariot sale. He didn't bargain or put them in the want ads or the classifieds for the surrounding nations. When he got sick and tired of the TV, he broke it, baby. He didn't put it in the paper and sell it. Sorry if that offends you. He took away the chariots and horses because they represented depending on the arm of flesh rather than the arm of God. And he looked around. He said, furthermore, there's a clean house around here in this country. And I want to know every place my father and my grandfather made an altar to a false god. And they searched the land, the entire segment of Judah, mile by square mile. And every time they found a place that Baal had ever been worshipped, they tore it down, stomped it to powder, and took all the dust of their fires and put it in the brook Kidron and washed it out into the Mediterranean Sea. If you please, he was doing this. Man, we have cleansed this land and God can visit his people. Finally, we have a land that can be cleansed for a Messiah to visit. He took away things that had existed for 300 years. This is the remarkable part. I told you nobody else had ever done this. Asa didn't do it. Hezekiah didn't do it. Uzziah didn't do it. None of them did it. He's sitting there. The land is clean. The temple is rebuilt, refurbished. They're working on it right now. Everything's going good. The land is clean. And he's, one day he got to thinking, he said, hey, where's all my stompers? All you boys come help me again. This ain't, I wouldn't plan on this, but you guys are such good sports. He said, where's all my stompers? You know what, boys? We got some more work to do. He said, that, that northern land over there, nobody's lived there for over a hundred years. Are you getting this? The northern nation had been carried into captivity in 721 B.C. Over a hundred years had gone by and nobody lived there. But he said, you know what, we might as well just go clean house down there too. And so he said, come on with me, boys. And they crossed. Come on, boys. And they crossed the boundary between Judah and Samaria or Israel. And when they got to the other side, he said, here's one, boys, right here. Stomp on that one a little bit. And they stomped on that one. And then he brought them a little farther. He said, come here, boys. Here's one over here. And the Bible says he went throughout the land. And he cleansed the northern land of everything that had ever been wrong. And he cleaned up a land that nobody cared about. Oh, you guys are awesome. All right, go back and sit down. I'll let you stomp some more in a minute. The Bible says 
he went and found. I don't know if you find this as incredible as I do. But he went and found the altar of Jeroboam from 300 years ago that had turned the heart of God's people away. And he said, you know what I'm going to do with that altar? I'm going to stamp it and I'm going to destroy it and I'm going to burn it because it was instrumental in turning God's people from him. And the Bible says he destroyed the altars of Jeroboam. He marched through the land like an avenging angel, like a till of the hun in the dark ages, leaving nothing but ravaged destruction in his wake. And everywhere there was a Baal priest, he killed him. Everywhere there was a grove, he conquered it, stamped it to powder. Are you hearing me? For the first time in 342 years, there was not a single idolatrous building standing in the promised land. Now do you see why Jeremiah wept? Do you see why Jeremiah wept when he died? Can you see why Jeremiah said we'll never see anything like this again as long as we live? He destroyed all of that. Whether you take Kings or Chronicles, the sequence here is reversed. I don't know. I'm giving it to you out of the sequence that I think happened. He came back to Jerusalem. And Dr. Seal, how he overlooked it, I don't know. But so did Hezekiah and Uzziah. And he walked back in the city of Jerusalem feeling pretty good about himself. The land for the first time in 350 some odd years was now completely free of any touch, hint, or residue of idolatry. And you're going to tell me he's not a great man? And I haven't even told you his legacy yet. He did that and he walked back in and he said, Wait, wait, wait! What is this? They said, uh, uh, Well, that's the building that Solomon built to Milcom to honor the gods of one of some of his wives. What? What's that one? That one's built to Shemosh. And that one? That one's built. And they went through. And buildings that had stood for 342 years and had not even been noticed by the other good reformers, when Asa's gaze fell on him, he had such a conviction. I want this in my heart. He had such a conviction that if it even speaks any way of idolatry, it's got to go. He said, tear it down. And one of the final acts of his kingship was with sledgehammer and crowbar, they waded into those temples that had stood for 342 years since the day of Solomon's golden age. And he said, there will never again be competition in my lifetime with the temple of God. Nothing that competes with God's temple has a right to stand in the presence of Almighty God. Sister Valen, would you come to the organ, please? He looked around finally. And as a young man, relatively young, 39 years old, sitting on his king, kingdom, looking, as far as he could look in any direction, homosexuality had been banned and destroyed out of the land. Their houses were destroyed. The altars were destroyed of false gods. Every grove has been destroyed. The dust carried off into foreign parts, thrown into the river, washed into the sea. There's not a hint or a residue of anything that's not like God. And Jeremiah watched and observed this revival. Wow. Toward the end of his reign, some young men were born. In fact, they were about six years old when Josiah died. 
Josiah made one fateful bad decision in his life. He elected to align himself with a king in a war that didn't concern him. Got into his chariot and went to battle. And the arrows of the archers flew through the air and found its mark. Josiah was slain in the battle on the plains of Megiddo. They took him and put him in his second chariot and brought him back to Jerusalem and laid him to rest in the sepulcher of the kings. And the Bible says, Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. Do you understand? Lamenting is not a simple act of weeping. Lamenting is a sign of intense bereavement. Knowing that what has just slipped through your fingers will never, ever be replaced. It's symbolized by tearing your garments, wearing sackcloth, screaming at the top of your lungs. And in the midst of all of that, I read to you tonight where the Bible says, Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. He wept and the nation was shocked. And the nation wept. And Jeremiah picked up his pen and wrote concerning Josiah, Under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. And when Josiah died, those boys were only six years old. Twelve years later, after three puppet kings had sat on the throne and Nebuchadnezzar invaded the land and reached out and gathered the top 10,000 candidates of the land. And the Bible says he took those that were wise and well favored and he carried them down into captivity. Among that little handful of 10,000 people that Nebuchadnezzar gathered up was a long young man by the name of Daniel and another one by the name of Shadrach and another one by the name of Meshach and another one by the name of Abednego. And you want to know, he was talking about standing last night. You know why they knew how to stand? Because there was a man by the name of Josiah that cast a shadow that reached clear to Babylon. He cast a shadow. You may be seated. I'm finished, but let me. He cast a shadow, Dr. Shield, that reached 500 miles to Babylon. He cast a shadow that lasted 70 years of their captivity. And 70 years later, when all of the years of Jubilee that had never been kept were finally kept. For God said, you won't keep the year of Jubilee, therefore I'll force you to. You multiply 50 times 70, 3,500 years. They went to Babylon and God said, I'm going to force you to keep every year of Jubilee that you never kept. You're out of the land and it will lay dormant until you come back. And they went down into Babylon. And they stayed for 70 years. And right now I wish I had your telling, storytelling, Sister Martin. Because this scene is so incredible. If I could tell it like you could, I could do such a better job. But I want you to picture a Persian king with the guilt, all of the gold, the wealth of the world, sitting on his throne. He's a new king. It's the first year that he's reigned. And he feels something in his heart. He says, bring me the prime minister. Bring me a parchment. Bring me a quill. I have an edict to write. If you were with me in Second Chronicles 35, all you have to do is flip the page. The very next book, Ezra 1 and 1 and 2, tells us that in the first year of King Cyrus, king of Persia, he made a proclamation that God, the God of heaven, the high God of heaven, has dealt with me to rebuild the house of Jerusalem. And standing in that room, I'm convinced as sure as I'm standing here tonight, was an elderly man now in
in his 80s that by his own writing according to Daniel chapter 10 and verse number 1 stayed in power until the third year of King Cyrus who was named 330 years before by the prophet Jeremiah and others that said Cyrus will come and sign an edict and there stands a man in his late 80s who has now been prime minister of Babylon for over 70 years, who has weathered every storm and every situation, who has gone to the lion's den out of envy of his peers that couldn't stand him because he pointed his face toward Jerusalem and prayed three times a day, who in my opinion is the top candidate to have written Psalm 119. I can argue with you about that. I believe he's the man that wrote the 119th Psalm. No temple, no preacher, nothing but the word of God. But I believe in the heart of Daniel was a love for that word. And I'm telling you, I am convinced in my heart that it was Daniel standing there as the prime minister. For it was signed in the first year of King Cyrus. And he was the prime minister until the third year of King